However, we have, we have to wait until late April. <laughs> Oh, I wasn't sure it was last week. Okay, that's fine. These two chairs are put together. Yeah, I just saw that. <laughs> uh, let me just make sure. Okay. Uh, let me distribute uh, a car. Your name, your class, your specialization. If you don't have it, that's fine. For your name, if uh, you happen to be uh, a different name, uh, I mean another name, like in Chinese or Japanese, write it down. It's much easier for me to remember. And right now, as uh, many of you know, these uh, scholars working on China all have Chinese names. And uh, they are more famous, often they are more famous with their Chinese names in China. Uh, just uh, like if you go to a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, uh, with the exception like Hong Kong, most of the restaurants will have two names. They are not even related. Mm. And, and you know, there's uh, one restaurant called the Royal East, very good restaurant. The Chinese name is what? Wu Yehua or no? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. So many restaurants uh, in San Francisco or other places, you have two entirely different names. One uh, English name, one Chinese name. Give me one card. For your, you have one? Yeah. For your name, uh, class, and uh, your special, your, your concentration. For, for Xunzi, um, oh sure, I don't want you to keep it here, <laughs> unless you forget your name. <coughs> yes, it's called Wu Yehua. Pardon me? Wu Yehua. Wu Yehua. Royal Beast, which means the, uh, uh, the Mayflower. Mayflower. especially in the classical period, as the paradigmatic Confucian master. And especially if we look at uh, uh, historically, you know, from our point of view, probably more dimensions. When I say para para uh, you know, um, paradigmatic Confucian master, I mean the three major areas of the Confucian tradition, uh, the way, scholarship, and um, practice. All these three areas, he uh, 
not only covered all these three areas, he was outstanding. He was the exemplar of all three of them. As a Confucian master, we know that the Confucian way is uh, learning to be human. And Xun Zi really defined in, a, in his specific way uh, this process of learning to be human with particular emphasis on a specific kind of learning. And therefore, in the very beginning of the text, you have this uh, notion about exaltation of learning. And it's, uh, it's ceaseless. It's basically cultivation of the person. Later, say, the study of the high mind and the study of human nature and destiny. And this, this particular kind of learning is based upon a person as a central relationship. So Xu Zi puts a lot of emphasis on uh, teachers and friends. And no one can actually learn simply all by himself. E even though learning is for the sake of the self, there's no indication whatsoever that uh, learning is uh, for the sake of the individual. Learning for the sake of the self is learning to be human and the self is understood as a person. And person is always multidimensional. A person is always a center of relationships. So the person is never an individual in the modern sense and certainly the uh, Confucian tradition as uh, uh, as Xun Zi and mentions others uh, understood, was very, very social. You can say it's social, it's political, it's historical, it's a quest for meaning, and uh, it is also aesthetic in the point, in the sense of feeling. So his idea of learning is very, very comprehensive, and against mentions, say, learning is necessary because you really have to uh, internalize the values, because you don't have it. Uh, no human beings are endowed with these values, but human beings, like animals, you know, actually could be defined as uh, instinct uh, instinctive uh, demands. And these, insti these uh, instincts, if you allow them to express themselves in an excessive way, social harmony cannot be maintained. So in one area, he really uh, works out the Confucian way in the most comprehensive manner. And he, in fact, formed a Confucian fellowship uh, in one of the great uh, centers of learning called the Jixiao place. He uh, formed a at least uh, 70 or so scholars, uh, younger scholars. So he formed a fellowship, uh, formed a community, <coughs> a community of the like-minded people, the community of scholars. And he established this, uh, I think, remark remarkable idea about the relationship between the teacher and the student. The teacher is never involved in uh, instruction without the responding willingness of the student. If the student is not willing to learn, then the teacher, the teacher is not obligated to teach. So the beautiful example is like a bell, you know, the Chinese bell. Uh, if you hit the bell very gently, the bell will respond very gently. If you hit it very strongly, it will respond very strongly. And there's no way a teacher can be a teacher if he is not at the same time a student. Uh, to be student is a precondition for being a teacher. So the continuous learning, in other words, I mentioned it again, you know, to illiterate, uh, to uh, emphasize an uh, earlier point, that is, uh, learning is a, a flowing stream. Every person is in a dynamic process of unfolding rather than in a static structure. And unfortunately, many, many uh, philosophers uh, love to define a human being 